as Boris' position could be summarized today, no elementary quantum phenomenon is a phenomenon until it has been brought to a close by an irreversible act of amplification, like the triggering of a Geiger counter, or the click of a photodetector, or the blackening of a grain of photographic emulsion. Until that happens, this uh, phenomenon to be is not yet a phenomenon. It's like a great smoky dragon. It has no position in space, lo no location in time. You know only the tail where the quantum or the photon or the electron or whatever you're dealing with entered the equipment. But until the dragon has bit with its teeth one counter or the other, you have no right to speak of where it is or what it's doing. It's the strangest thing in this strange world, this elementary quantum phenomenon of Niels Bohr. And yet, of all the things we've learned, it is the central point and lesson of 20th century physics. So that the tail that gave rise to that dragon, that great smoky dragon, uh, gave us only a smoky dragon it did not become a definite phenomenon until at the end we by our choice of observing device made it bite equipment give us a phenomenon produce a count or blacken a grain of emotion so in this sense we have become participators in the construction of the universe we have no right to say that the past exists independent of the act of observation. The past exists only insofar as it's present in the records of the here and the now. One of the most interesting things about mathematical physics is how seemingly complex or chaotic behavior can be describable using models that are in some way tractable by our minds. In quantum systems, for example, we often see behavior which is completely at odds with our common sense understanding about particles such as atoms and electrons, and their behavior in certain materials or in certain phases of matter. Some examples of these purely quantum systems can give real challenges to our understanding, almost to the point that, that we can ask ourselves, is what we are witnessing really physics at all? Such systems include Bose-Einstein condensates, where we can see individual atoms coalesce into a state where they behave as if, as if they were one single particle creating quantum macroscopic effects, normally seen only at very small scales. Other systems include the effect of quantum entanglement, where individual particles can seemingly interact with each other in non-local behavior without having to worry about the classical restrictions of time and space. One effect which is visually fascinating are the physical properties of superconductors, where we can witness the strange consequences of a phase transition that arises in certain materials where conduction electrons join together to form single quasi-particles and interact with each other using exchanges only describable by quantum mechanics, with the consequences being strange and unclassical descriptions of resistance and magnetism in materials. These seemingly unrelated and hard to grasp phenomena, however, can be made tractable using a combination of mathematical models with analogies to more classical theories of motion and exchange of certain variables. In quantum and classical systems, momentum is the core variable that seems to link the two concepts together mathematically. All systems, classical, quantum, and even relativistic, must conserve momentum. However, some of the ways in which momentum is characterized in these separate fields means that a kind of translation is necessary. Momentum in classical mechanics and relativity is described as a vector quantity, but in quantum mechanics it is also describable as a mathematical operator, which are represented in notation for their application in calculations, normally involving wave functions and matrices. Exchange of momentum in quantum mechanics can be represented in different coordinate systems, and one interesting way to represent the angular momentum of a particle is by using a phase space coordinate system. This is usually accomplished by means of Fourier transform of the particle from position space to momentum phase space. Quantities such as the charge of the particle in a field, such as an electric field, can be described in terms of the particle's angular momentum. In this way, seemingly arbitrary and unrelated 
Labels of particle dynamics, such as its charge, spin, and so on, can be represented as momentum in phase space. A more subtle way to understand quantum mechanics is to realize that the dynamic behavior of particles in quantum mechanics is a complex adaptive system. What do I mean by this? Quantum mechanics, as we discussed, can be based on rules of momentum exchange between particles. These rules are precise. However, within quantum mechanics is a description of the particle as a wave function of its probabilities, not only its probabilities of position, but probabilities of momentum. This is true in real position space or phase momentum space. Therefore, we can see an interplay, a balance, between the exploitation of our momentum exchange rules and the probabilistic dynamics of the system. This creates a system which is complex, but also adaptive, analogous to the problem of gradient descent, with a randomly varying term added to it. This leads us to our original proposition, how to represent quantum behavior in which our classical minds can understand. One way is to create mathematical relations between this complex adaptive behavior and classical interpret interpretations of momentum exchange. Newton's cradle offers the archetypal model for momentum exchange in classical mechanics. It turns out that by representing complex adaptive systems in terms of the path integral formalism of quantum field theory, we can create a model with the properties of metaheuristic synchronization in quantum-like networks that can be further formalized into a kind of quantum Newton's cradle. What is more interesting still is the fact that some of the mathematics used here also makes certain summation rules associated with braid networks more describable in terms of quantum mechanics. It's interesting to note that the quantum Newton's cradle has been used extensively in recent years in the description of Bose-Einstein condensates and their behavior of momentum exchange in the laboratory. An underlying structure between these seemingly different phenomena can be made using mathematical physics. With a bit of imagination tied with visual demonstration, we can try to make certain recalcitrant aspects of quantum behavior and complex adaptive systems in general much more easier to understand. Moreover, we can begin to see that many of the systems in nature that we see as too complicated or chaotic to make sensible predictions are nevertheless not without structure and emerge from an interplay of rules and our dynamics that we can describe. One of the puzzling aspects of the different physical theories is the question of why should the laws of physics behave differently at different scales if there should be no absolute frames of reference in the universe as a whole. It's sort of the opposite to the argument given in favor of the turtle stacking model of suspension of the earth, where a person who believes that the earth is suspended on the back of a giant turtle is asked, but what suspends a turtle? To which he or she answers, simple, it's turtles all the way down. This example, though humorous, does reflect our need for sensible models to describe non-local behavior, be it the position of the earth in space or electrons in the atom. If we were to accept, with equal but scientifically verifiable passion, how the fundamental particles that make up atoms, molecules and matter are themselves suspended to the rules of quantum theory, could we not also make a similar argument to turtle stacking, but in reverse, that is to ask, is it really quantum all the way from down to up? The correspondence principle states that classical mechanics is merely the classical limit of quantum mechanics, specifically in the limit as the ratio of Planck's constant to the action of the system tends to zero. So in certain interpretations of quantum theory, such as the path integral interpretation, we see the cancelling out of quantum effects by the separate particle histories causing decoherence with one another. So that in effect, we are expected to assume that we lose some of the quantumness in the wash, so to speak from the microscopic world to the mesoscopic and macroscopic. The question that still arises, however, is that if quantum theory suspends the behavior of atoms, matter and everything else from the ground up, then shouldn't there be some quantum effects that translate across the scales, even relatively small quantum effects? In this sense, this is the sameness problem in physics, where we can ask why do we not see some of the features that govern quantum effects reappear at larger scales in some of the aspects of structure of the universe. Unlike the turtle stacking analogy, this is not an unreasonable question to ask. After all, quantum effects occur at small scales. Then there must be a lot of these effects that add up, even an ordinary piece of matter. Macroscopic magnetic effects, for example, is the amplification 
of the individual magnetic moments of atoms in a material, which are related directly to the quantum spin of individual atoms and electrons. If there is not a sameness across all physical theories, then we may be forced to admit that many of the separate subsets of physics are not branches as much as they are appendages soon to be glued together by some insofar witnessed unification. It should be recognized that just because we have a loose set of theories that we are able to grind up experimental data and churn out predictions does not mean we truly understand the principles behind the theory and we may be just working with the mathematical physicist equivalent of a black box that just only lets us witness the inputs and outputs in a blinding shut up and calculate fashion. In mathematics, the application of fractals in geometry provides a clear insight to this concept of sameness being apparent across scales, being made popular by the mathematics of Gaston Julia and both Mandelbrot and others. In fractal geometry, we see that complex geometrical patterns, some of which begin to imitate the kind of patterns we see in the natural world, they have this sort of principle of sameness, of general shape, operating at different scales. What is most surprising is how these patterns can emerge from simple rules of continuous iteration without the need for specific coded instructions to create the precise shapes of these patterns. In bifurcation diagrams, for example, we see patterns emerge from a combination of following a computation with a randomly varying term or set of terms added to it. The potentially infinite, often repeating patterns could not have been explicitly coded as infinite amounts of instructions would be required be translated in an arcane fashion into such code. They arise from a balance between exploration and exploitation in the system, the core feature of a metaheuristic procedure. We can also begin to see that unlike the relatively abstract and idealized geometry that we're forced to learn in school about perfect cubes, spheres, cones and so on, this fractal geometry seems to create the kind of shapes and patterns that are seen in physical phenomena of the real world. Those of the shapes of mountains, river systems, blood vessels, clouds, continents, and even in the vast networks of galaxy clusters as seen in the large-scale universe. Shapes, which are completely invariant across scales. It becomes apparent when studying the mathematics of scalar fields and how they couple that we see kinds of power law systems emerging from networks of scalar fields that are coupled with one another, and how similar this appears to the mathematics of discontinuous pass coupling a metaheuristic technique that involves a defined signaling term with a randomly oscillating delay term to achieve an emergent equilibrium. In effect, we see a duality between such scalar fields and self-synchronizing quantum networks. The emergent synchronization and equilibrium of these systems is favored as being the energetic ground state of the system that the state evolves toward over time. Even in systems that are not explicitly programmed to achieve this kind of emergent adaptive network, such as naturally occurring quantum systems, for example nanoribbons, bosons and condensates, networks of quantum spins and magnetic materials to name a few, it can arise naturally by ha simply having the individual nodes exploit a power law for coupling with a randomly varying term. As we discussed in a previous video, many of the fundamentals of quantum theory behave this way exploiting a very precise and simple series of, ex of momentum exchange rules with a randomly varying probabilistic term to create a kind of emergent quantum behavior that we see in the so-called pure quantum systems. If this is true, then there must be some quantum mechanisms underlying classical chaos in such systems. In our previously discussed model of the 2D quantum Newton's cradle, the balls are replaced by our signaling atoms or electrons confined in rows. Adding additional momentum, such as a photon from a laser, can kick the atoms into motion, causing them to oscillate back and forth, just as in the classical Newton's cradle. Unlike the toy, however, the atoms in the quantum Newton's cradle can both collide and pass through one another because of the oddities of quantum physics, such as quantum tunneling. This leads to some of our histories of the different paths a particle can travel. Just as in classical mechanics, with our quantum Newton's cradle, as the strength of the interaction is increased, or continues over time, the motion of each of the cradle's atoms in the arrangement can be transitioned from periodic motion to chaotic motion. Now, this is the equivalent of the momentum space distribution of atoms approaching a thermal, e thermal distribution over a frequency of time, 
indicating that the system is reaching some new equilibrium state. In effect, we have synchronized the system of atoms to respond collectively. In certain quantum transition effects, with thermalization of groups of atoms, we also see the effects of quantum chaos which create complex structure from simple momentum transition rules. A small section of electrons in a thermalized system, when perturbed, can cause interactions which have effects that iterate out into the entire system, even without direct contact between the individual electrons, non-local behavior in effect. The spectral properties of these non-interacting two-dimensional electrons in magnetic fields that are contained in a lattice can also create self-similar fractal patterns. These were first discovered in the 1976 PhD work of Douglas Hofstadter. Hofstadter described the structure in 1976 in his modeling of the energy levels of block electrons in magnetic fields. It gives a graphical representation of the spectrum of Harper's equation at different frequencies. The intricate mathematical structure of this spectrum was independently discovered by Soviet physicist Mark Asbel in 1964 and is sometimes referred to as the Asbel-Hofstadter model. The fact is that the nonlinear effects of imperfections and random behavior, in addition to the quantum exchanges during photon-electron interactions and electron-electron interactions, will inevitably lead to some kind of emergent chaos that is seen in classical systems, such that a small change in the position of an atom arrangement in a crystal lattice or the random excitation of quasi-particles in a moment, certain momentum state will inevitably lead to an emergent pattern, which will be drastically different to the original pattern. By creating a grid of 2D atoms, we can simulate this effect and make a relationship between the system behavior across the map of the fractal pattern. The grid is the energy surface the atoms are binded to. Mathematically, this is a matrix, the Hamiltonian matrix. It is the general principle of quantum mechanics that there is an operator for every physical observable, for energy and momentum operators, for example, which can be measured. In a system that is defined by a wave function, which is an eigenfunction, this acts on an operator, then the system is said to be an eigenstate. The values for energy or momentum operators are therefore eigenvalues. In the 2D square grid, we can represent the evolution of the eigenstate as an emergent fractal pattern, with the pattern being highly ordered and dependent on slight tweaking of the initial conditions of the atom's topology in the lattice. For example, let's take the idea of 2D electrons in a, in a square lattice and then compare with a hexagonal lattice. In the arrangement of atoms, the momentum exchange rules are the same in each case. However, due to the position of the atoms creating changes in the small and randomized position of the particles, the emergent patterns will be completely different. Even though our change in the arrangement was simple, the emergent fractal nature of the spectrum shows completely different results. This is not decoherence of any kind. The system is still behaving as an isolated thermal bath, However, a local variation causes perturbations that reverberate throughout the network in a complex and adaptive system that reinforces itself. The emergent nature of the different energy level structure is also apparent, with the electron transition regime in the hexagonal lattice now appearing much more relativistic as compared to the 2D lattice. The onset of cha chaotic behavior in the system can be used to describe how interacting quantum particles drive certain materials such as graphene or superconducting crystals, to a thermal equilibrium. This insight is important to note as many technological devices, quantum technological devices, are being considered that rely on non-equilibrium quantum effects. Of particular interest are devices that use the cuprate high temperature superconductors, most notably BISCO, which has a crystal structure that behaves as a natural form of Josephson junction. These are considered one of the most promising elements in quantum sensors and as potential processors in the much-touted field of neuromorphic quantum computing using scalar coupling that can occur between separate Josephson junctions in quantum circuits. However, many of the design considerations of both quantum-based sensors and the hardware used for quantum computing seems to ignore the fundamental nature of quantum chaos, or else think that it's just a description of chaos that's somehow not important to the development of the quote-unquote 
new age of quantum machines. Fundamentally, it is still an unsettling definition as to why quantum mechanical systems are framed to be in the domain of what we arbitrarily call small, especially when we see effects in the, in the laboratory, such as quantum entanglement, superconductivity, superfluidity and Bose-Einstein condensation that have nothing to do with being small, length or even time scales. So the foundations of quantum theory may not really be dependent on what we refer to as the size scale of the physical laws, but upon a more underlying factor that operates independently across different scales. The factor of an emerging quantum chaos that goes on to define a system's quantum behavior that is conceptually just as impressive and maybe even complementary to the concepts of fractal sameness across scales. The observable universe hosts a vast array of complex systems across many different fields of interest. These can be modeled using theories that use a layer of abstraction to separate the complexity from the fundamental nature of the individual interactions. Describing complex systems as systems of oscillators may sound obscure, but in a strange convenience, it describes in a generative way all sorts of physical systems and not just in the context of standard classical and quantum harmonics. As examples, there are lots of physical, chemical, biological, and even social systems that can be reduced to populations of harmonic and anharmonic oscillators. The heartbeat, for example, is just a collection of oscillating heart cells that a wave propagates on. And synchronizing neurons in the brain are oscillators as well, and have been treated with these methods to give a rich understanding of the kinds of patterns that we see experimentally. Rather than just simply observing and recording the patterns in such reductionist systems, abstract generative models must be constructed if we are to enrich our understanding beyond simply measuring outputs from abstract models. In higher level modeling, we can say that ensembles of globally coupled systems of oscillators can manifest in a synchronization into the appearance of a macroscopic mean field in this mean field theory, an ensemble of particles, highly coupled through entanglement, for example, can give rise to a scalar field, or a scalar field can itself mediate a strong coupling between ensembles of particles. Both views happen to be equivalent, and we have what we call a duality of description. Natural systems of synchronized particles can also form macroscopic mean fields, such as atoms and Bose-Einstein condensates, or electrons in superconductors, where we have integer multiples of the individual particles and quasiparticles. In these condensates of bosons, we see spontaneous breaking of symmetry of the condensate, where it does not matter if one adds a particle or subtracts it from the condensate itself, a mechanism which may appear odd in terms of charge transfer but in terms of representing this in terms of momentum, it appears obvious, such as in the quantum Newton's cradle model. The core reason why we have the separation of the different nodes in an ensemble of integer particles is down to the uncertainty principle, and in condensates of bosons, this is the cause of the separations that we see. Quite often, clusters of synchronized elements are observed in between the regions of the unsynchronized elements. In a type 2 superconductor, for example, we see an intermediate phase of ordinary conductivity by unsynchronized electrons mixed with the superconductivity mediated by the synchronization of electrons in the Cooper pairs, which are a quasi-particle. This effectively means that we have a mixture of a synchronous condens condensate with asynchronous individual charge carriers at intermediate temperature and fields above the synchronization phases. Synchronicity and asynchronicity might seem dichotomous conditions of a functioning system, yet both states can in fact exist simultaneously and durably within a system of oscillators in what is called a chimera state. Chimera states are patterns where synchronous and asynchronous domains coexist, taking its name from the composite creature in Greek mythology. According to the myth, 
The main power of the Chimera is that the closer someone gets to it, as they are pursuing it, the further away it is from you in actuality. This has an ironic resonance with the Chimeras we are talking about in the context of systems of quantum oscillators and chaos theory. The exotic state still holds a lot of mystery, but its fundamental nature offers potential in understanding the governing dynamics across many scientific fields. Of particular interest in this work is the effect symmetries of a complex system can have on the emergence of chimera states. For example, the effect of having the same versus different coupling strengths of the outer regions of the mean field to the center regions can cause a breaking in the symmetry of synchronization. This drives the system to adapt and perform a kind of emergent error correction or annealing. Such annealing can occur in systems of harmonic oscillators, both classical and quantum. Chimera states are therefore an integral part of any emergent complex adaptive system. Such systems can be used to simulate other complex systems with equivalent behavior and can be used to solve optimization problems. In machine learning techniques, for example, several optimization problems can be represented as paths or logical decision trees, which themselves can be reduced to the Boolean satisfiability problem or SAT problem. Basically, it's an algebraic or Boolean logic expression that looks like the following equation. Think of, for example, trying to find on a map the shortest path to take on foot from one part of a city to another. If you wanted to do a brute force search, you'd be trying every single possibility that existed. Or perhaps you're studying protein folding and you need to fold in the minimum energy configuration so that you can understand how proteins interact with viruses or the general way in which protein denaturing works. Now in these scenarios, you might also realize that nature doesn't trend towards the global minimum energy conf configuration and asynchronous effects have to be considered with the synchronous effects. So we are already entering the territory, so to speak, of the chimera. Another example is the knapsack problem, where you have a bunch of items, but you can only carry a certain amount. Suppose you're working for NASA and you're building a rocket and you're trying to figure out how much fuel to put into the rocket. But remember that fuel adds weight. So what are the optimal fuel to payload ratios? What's the value of each item versus its weight, where there are n objects with weights w and values v? Because these are optimization problems, the notion of solution is not entirely ad adequate. Backtracking is rather designed for decision problems, in which one should answer questions of the type, is there a feasible solution, or is there a feasible solution achieving a value of least v? In this case, the extension of a solution might again be a solution itself. These are all massive problems with tons of simulated parameters, but the common goal is to maximize the value of the object selected, respecting a limit W, the weight, on the sum of weights of the selected objects. In the design of a quantum network, the adiabatic theorem can be primarily used to solve the Boolean satisfiability problem such as the click network problem, a click being a complete subgraph of a total graph. The size of a click is the number of vertices it contains. The click problem is the optimization problem of finding a click of a maximum size in a graph. For this, we use the adiabatic Hamiltonian, where the solutions are the maxima and minima in terms of a graph, where there is a collection of nodes in a grid. This graph is analogous to a program in an adiabatic quantum computation, where the initial state of qubits are connected in a certain way in a network. As a side note, it so happens that even though adiabatic annealers and gate-based quantum computation are vastly different paradigms, the Wigner-Jordan transformation allows one to map fermionic problems onto an Ising spin model. The spin model can, of course, be implemented on an annealer, or through the use of the variational quantum algorithm can be implemented on a gate-based quantum computer. 
The annealing part of the variational quantum algorithm comes from using classical machine learning and network synchronization to find the parameters of the gates that minimize the ground state of the icing Hamiltonian. One thing that is easy for the adiabatic quantum computation to do is quantum error correction. The adiabatic theorem tells you that the longer you wait for your system to reach its final state, the more likely you are to have stayed in the ground state, or, said another way, the less likely you are to have excitations, which basically translate to errors. Therefore, in order to reduce the error, all you need to do is run the algorithm in the adiabatic quantum computation for a longer time. If you ran it for t equals to infinity, you would be 100% accurate. Mapping a problem to a Boolean satisfiability problem can be difficult, or can create added work in the translation. Imagine a problem that requires the number of qubits to scale with the number of real variables by a polynomial of high degree, or even worse, exponentially. You might also find that an approximate solver is not good when you have hard constraints that must not be violated. These machines also operate at finite time scale, therefore there is always some noise in the adiabatic quantum computer. Therefore, it is key to understand how such systems work with a mixture of synchronized and unsynchronized states to understand our chimera state for any given system in effect. These chimera states can form naturally in systems that can be treated as systems of oscillators, like the quantum systems that we've discussed. This is really the main reason why quantum systems should be considered applicable for solving these types of problems, Boolean SAT problems, in the first place in a quantum computer framework. As we've seen in a previous video, the quantum systems themselves can be very sensitive to initial conditions and can create chaos, even in controlled or isolated quantum systems. However, we see from looking at the mixture of asynchronous and synchronous elements in the chimera states and how they are in fact beneficial to driving an adiabatic quantum computing network to achieve quantum error correction, but at the same time allowing for it to behave as a metaheuristic system so that we never have the system becoming trapped in solutions corresponding to local minima, which are not the globally optimized solution to the problem. So in effect, our chimeras really offer the best signature for the quantum computation we are interested in using for solving the, the kinds of problems we may want a quantum network to solve. But what does a chimera state in a quantum system or network even look like? It turns out that a quantum system's response to the presence of a chimera state is a sharp transition at a critical value of a variable p, above which percolation occurs, but below which it doesn't occur. Near this critical value, the system is very sensitive to minor perturbations, and a number of intriguing phenomena, such as the formation of self-similar fractal patterns, can be observed, as we talked about in our discussion of chaotic systems in the context of quantum mechanics. These self-similar fractal patterns are found to take place at or near this transition point, which are called critical behaviors or percolation thresholds. Many complex systems, including biological and physical networks, are considered to be utilizing such critical behaviors for their self-organizing and information processing purposes. For example, there is a conjecture that animal nervous systems tend to be dynamically maintaining these critical states in their neural systems in order to maximize their sensitivity to response and in order to have information processing capabilities. Such self-organized criticality in natural systems has been a fundamental research topic in complex system science and relates intimately to the study of percolation thresholds, with these percolation thresholds corresponding themselves to chimera states. The chimera states are then said to be the metastable medium, or the discontinuous pass coupling, between a stable coupling regime and a disordered state in a network. Moreover, the link between the percolation dynamics of complex networks has not been lost on those that employ statistics in the analysis of such networks, such as 
the utilization of renormalization group theory, a technique straight from the quantum field theory toolkit, which is sometimes used to quantify the percolation thresholds of complex systems as a percentage. It's remarkable how self-similar dynamics of percolation thresholds can be applied to different areas of study, from monitoring the organization of groups of insects, the synchronization of signaling neurons in the brain, to the aspects of finance, or the dynamics of how forest fires set spread through the topology of an uneven landscape, all of which have chimera states hidden deep within the statistics. Even more astonishing is how to appreciate just how much the underlying factor of what we have flippantly re referred to as the randomization term work with the power laws that emerge from a coupling. The somewhat invisible flow of randomization is really what drives these systems that we've talked about to emergent equilibrium, critical behaviors, and towards the self-similar, self-organizing configurations. The true origin of randomization we know absolutely nothing about, the consequences of which has shaped the dynamism of the universe across and in between all possible limits. Not taking this amazement for granted, we may have to think about the emergent non-linear behavior and dynamics of the real world as merely an echo of the balance of synchronization and chaos that exists in the quantum mechanical foundations of the whole universe. The echo of the chimera that happens to emerge into our reality.